And we continue with uh, the next speaker. Okay. <coughs> One of the few examples where it actually makes sense to say, here is a person who does not need any introduction, because you all know Michel uh, Messalou, who be, uh, got his PhD in 2017 on the, on the uh, relation of Livonia to the uh, German Empire who has been working on bishops, on nobility, on legates, on networks, on aristocracy uh, in Livonia and uh, on historiography and latest even on iron production. Yeah, that's in the future. future. <laughs> that's the future. <laughs> that's the future. Yeah, it's coming. And now we'll talk about the King of Denmark in the eyes of these Estonian vassals and subjects. Please. Well, um, uh, we'll start with a very tiny historiographical note. The, um, the topic of say, Danish Estonian relations from the perspective of Danish Estonia uh, was mostly studied uh, during the second half of the 19th century and the early 20th century, especially uh, regarding the, um, the view of, of how the liegemen were uh, related to the king and what they thought of them, uh, the, of, of the king. So, and the, the idea of this uh, older generation of historians was that um, Danish Estonia uh, was part of the German history and not part of Danish history. So they separated this very uh, nationalistic way and they had the idea that um, it was an um, independent duchy which only linked to Denmark lay in that it shared the ruler. So that's exactly what Christian said. And the, the main difference between what we as uh, so historians now think of, of uh, these relations is that Thomas Rees and uh, Niels Kuhn Nielsen in the 70s and 80s uh, are for me, you know, in my opinion, prove that this idea is wrong, that uh, Bunger and the other uh, older Baltic German historians were wrong when they thought of this, that this, the only link is just in the person. Uh, so this is the first uh, major paradigm shift in the history of writing of, of the relations between Denmark and Danish Estonia. That, that Danish Estonia was part of the Danish kingdom as a duchy or a part of the kingdom as a region. This is something that we can debate about, but it is not a personal union. It, the, the, the relation is much more deeper. That is, uh, in my opinion, completely clear. So the point is that there's also a second very important paradigm shift which has occurred uh, between the, the, <laughs> the beginning of the 20th century, uh, so at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and now that this is that um, back at that time the relation between the king and the aristocracy was studied from the idea that they were competing for power. So one would see that how much power did this king have in his kingdom at the time or in this region at the time and how much power did the aristocracy had, so the idea was that they were constantly fighting for power and for that reason um, I think the Baltic German historians uh, interpreted uh, Danish Estonia as basically almost independent, saying that you know that the Liegemen were the real rulers of Danish Estonia, so Astaf von Dranze and Rosenek uh, went even so far as to call uh, Danish Estonia a uh, uh, Republic of the Noblemen. So in, in 1911. So, and this new paradigm shift is that nowadays people, <laughs> that historians tend to view royal authority as functioning in cooperation with the elite of a kingdom, of a region. And they say that, you know, the, the, there is, of course, there is some strife, but none of these two parts cannot um, rule on their own. So, royal authority, royal reign can only function through the elite, in cooperation with the most important lay and clerical people of the region. So Stefan pointed to this already when he spoke about how the Bishop of Tallinn and all the other bishops uh, of the Danish kingdom were part of the royal council. So mm -hmm. they were counseling the king, they took part in the making of the decisions. And this is the same uh, role that was also played by the most important layman of a kingdom or a territory. So, and the idea is that the relations of the Danish-Estonian elite 
uh, with the Danish king have never studied, been studied uh, from the perspective of at this, after these two paradigm changes. So, and this is what I intend to do now. So it's, it's a, a new approach. And I will begin with a, a very little known source. It's a, a small, extremely small chronicle from the Tallinn city archives. Uh, so the chronicle of Denmark, uh, written in part. So that's, that's what it's written in the beginning. Uh, the, this is a manuscript that dates from sometime around uh, 1347-ish. So, uh, Stina Gala has said to me that it's the same scribe that wrote the copies of the privileges of Reva that, that uh, Tina showed earlier. Uh, it's, it's very short, short and it has been published already in 1873, but uh, very few historians have, uh, have used it. Uh, but Niels Kim Nielsen has. So he has quoted parts of it in his uh, Danish language book uh, of Danish history from 1250 to, to 1400. Um, it seems to be, or not sure, it seems to be an abridged version of a longer chronicle. Uh, it's uh, unclear to, to what extent the text was composed or compiled here, but it's quite clear that the final, final uh, sentences describing the fate of the sons of Christopher II, so Otto and uh, Valdemar IV, and the sale of Danish Estonia, these seem to be written here. So it's clear that a scribe in Reval had access to some sort of a chronicle of the Danish kings and deemed it important enough to produce a copy, maybe an abridged copy. Um, so this text has, um, it's, it's not, uh, e so it doesn't, doesn't equal to any known Danish chronicle, but some parts of it um, are also present in other chronicles. There's one annual, uh, I forgot the, the, which particular one, but at least one of the Danish annals uses a cer certain phrases that are also used here, and the chronicle of uh, Peters Olai also uses the same phrases that these annals use. So it may be uh, some sort of Danish chronicle which has been lost, uh, but uh, an abridged Mm, or reworked version of it is available here. Uh, in the sense of it, it's, it's basically a king's list. It starts with Eric I, uh, so who, who went to the crusade. It mentions that uh, three things about Eric I, that he got uh, the pallium, so the, he got uh, the establishment of the Archbishopric of Lund. So the, 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 the establishment of the Danish Archbishopric. Second, that he went on a crusade, and third, that he died in Cyprus. And it also says that his body was later brought back to Denmark, as it is said, which, as far as I know, is not true. <laughs> so the, this is, and then uh, it continues on with the list of Danish kings, uh, only mentioning that uh, who was whose relative until it uh, comes to Valdemar II. So Valdemar II is the second king, about whom something at least is said. And it's, it's really short, so the only that he, he ruled together with his son and that he subjugated the stone. Uh, the later kings, uh, uh, a bit more no, information is on them, but this is really an extremely sparse chronicle. And then it, it ends with uh, the sale of, uh, of Estonia by Valdemar the, the Fourth, and it has very specific information uh, that um, the sale was um, done by Lord Stigot, so he was the last uh, Danish viceroy, and he was exactly the man who went to Marienburg in Prussia. Uh, he was the Danish king's envoy in making the deal, so it's completely correct. And he's, he also had the authority to use the king's seal. So uh, this may be, you know, I'd say the, the most closest info on the sale of Danish Estonia, which is not a documentary source. So this, is, this info seems to be completely correct, as far as we know, from everything else. Uh, and it also says um, a little bit about Otto. Uh, just before that, he, he said that Otto joined the Teutonic Order. So he took on religious life, which in this sense does not mean that he became a cleric. He became religious life as in the sense that he took on monastic vows as a knightly brother. At least this is my interpretation. So uh, I will not speak more about the chronicle uh, 
because you know it is published, so you can read it yourself. <laughs> but uh, this one thing that there's one king that is missing, and it's Valdemar well the third. So this is the info on Christopher the second. It mentions him, he, his son, and that he was expelled. And then uh, the next sentence is that uh, he had two sons, Otto and Valdemar. So there's no info on, on Valdemar the third, like he never existed. Then. If the chronicle was written in the 1340s, that meant that this person was still alive because he was a minor uh, during his rule. So I, I think that he's mm, deliberately been forgotten. Uh, so uh, as far as we know, Danish Estonia never accepted the role of Valdemar III. He, um, so he seems to have been never accepted as a legitimate, legitimate king in Danish Estonia. So we'd say that. Um, the, his exclusion from the, from the list of Danish kings would then um, point to a specific Estonian understanding of who are, who, who were the legitimate Danish rulers and, and who were not legitimate Danish rulers. So, uh, this chronicle, the manuscript, is the oldest surviving chronicle manuscript produced in Estonia, even though it's really small. And, in my opinion, it demonstrates an interest towards the history of Denmark and the history of the kings of Denmark, among the leading circles of the town of Reval, at least, uh, shortly after the sale of Danish Estonia, the Teutonic Order. So, and I would say that it belongs among the several manifestations of Reval as a royal Danish city. So, we have already seen the medieval coat of arms in Thomas Rees' presentation. Here is the uh, the seal image of the civic authority of Reval. So this one is from 1313, but this type of seal is known first already from 1277. And it's, it's based on the double side, the royal seal of the Danish king. So on the one side they took the heraldic leopard lions, and then this head of the king is taken from the other side of the seal. It's, you know, so... Um, the body is German historian in the 19th century thought that this was Margaret, but if you compare it with the seals of, of King uh, Eric V, for example, it's very similar. So it's most probably a, a king and not, not a queen. So they basically take the Danish king's seal and they use it as their own. Uh, they mint coins with the crown, of course, because they had a royal mint there. So it's very obvious that Revel presented itself as a Danish royal city. And it, they continued to use this imagery even after uh, uh, the area was sold to the Teutonic Order. Then it's part of the remembrance because, as Tina said, all of the most important privileges, rights, and liberties derive from the Danish period of rule. Now, let's go on to the liegemen. The liegemen also present themselves to others as. Uh, liegemen of the king, so in a clear and clear connection to the Danish king. As far as we know, <laughs> their numbers were uh, 114, so in this, uh, the, the Danish uh, Valdemar's survey. So I think there may have been more of them later on, but you know, there's so approximately 120 persons, uh, of whom Paul Hansen has said that 15 of them were uh, like huge landowners or magnates. So we have like a small 10% who uh, was, let's say, the leading group and uh, it's quite similar that we have the Danish um, king's Estonian councillors, that number 12. So it's, it's quite a similar number of people uh, compared to what Johansen said about the, who were the magnates and the rest. And these people, uh, so they have a corporation which um, <coughs> Course itself consistently uh, universitas or uh, communitas, so the collective of the vassals of the Danish king, vassals of the king of Denmark. There is only one uh, document which, in which they, they use the term all vassals of the land of Reval. And the land of Reval, Reval is a alternative name uh, for Northern Estonia under Danish rule, which was used in the second half of the 13th century in the, uh, and the first half of the 14th century. For example, the um, chronicle of uh, the Livonian Rhine Chronicle refers to Northern Estonia consistently as Land of Reval, or Reval 
And sometimes uh, you cannot understand if the chronicler is speaking about the town of Revali or the region, because th they have the same name. And also the Danish kings sometimes use this name and other, uh, there are other charters as well that use this term, Revala, or Revala, the land of Revala for Northern Estonia. So um, the second uh, part is that not only did the, this uses uh, of the um, self, -re self presentation of vessels of the king was used by the uh, corporation was also sometimes used by individual vassals when they're giving out charters to say I this and this vassal of the Danish king have done this and this of course not in every time but still there are several charters where uh, an, a, a single individual would refer to it himself as a liegeman of the king second of all uh, we have the, the group of councillors of the king of Denmark in Estonia so they are 12 men, as far as we know, they are appointed by the king uh, and chosen from among the vassals. And again, they issue charters as a group uh, and they always use the term councillors of the Danish king in Estonia. And again, there's one charter, one, one letter where the, uh, the merchants of Lübeck uh, refer to them as councillors of the land. But uh, in all other charters, they are referred to as councillors of the King of Denmark. And after Estonia was sold to the Teutonic Order, they started to call themselves councillors of the Grand Master of the Teutonic Order. So they kept the principle of they had they are the councillors of the person, not of the region. And as far as we know, uh, the liegemen uh, and the councillors were also perceived as vassals of the Danish King in neighboring areas. So I already mentioned the Teutonic Order Chronicle uh, of um, the Leonian the Rhine Chronicle, which consistently refers to these people as the king's men. So, and it says when introducing uh, these people that you know, Revala is a land that was conquered by a Danish king. It is uh, his, um, his, his ruled by him, and he has uh, his men there. So, and then later on, it's just the king's men, king's men from Revala. So they are. It's obvious that. They, have, they are perceived as the men of the Danish king, not just, you know, um, just of some other king. And uh, several charters issued by the Teutonic Order, the Archbishop of Riga, the Cathedral Chapter of Riga, the Bishop of Dorpat, Asilia, even the Grand Prince Andrei Alexandrovich of Vladimir and Novgorod, uh, by Grand Duke Edininas of Lithuania, by the Swedish Viceroy in Finland, by Burgers of Lübeck, Gotland and Riga, by Dominican friars in Visby, by Pope Boniface VIII and so on, they all speak of these people as liegemen of the Danish king in Estonia. So they are the king's men, they are the king's liegemen. Uh, so this is self-presentation and also which was accepted in, in, a, in a wider area. So, and as Thomas Rees has already discussed this, I just repeat it, that they are defending this status as direct royal vassals. In the Alliance of 1304, in my interpretation, what this, uh, this uh, bond between the vassals and the king is, is that it's the feudal bond, which the king has no right to break, because this feudal bond is the original condition. So, the status of a royal vassal is the original condition of the liegeman and it has to stay on so and it would be a violent offense if the king breaks this bond and the same uh, story is written in the introductory uh, passage of the code of the feudal law for Danish Estonia the so-called Valdemar Eric feudal law which was issued uh, confirmed and issued by Eric Menrad in 1315 and it begins with the story of Valdemar's conquest of Danish Estonia along with the clerics and the men, you know, and the warriors of Denmark, then that the king gave out the first fiefs and also gave out the feudal law. And this feudal law then has been respected by every subsequent Danish king. Mm -hmm. So this is the norm. And if you read the text, then of course, <laughs> the text consistently refers to the feudal relation between the king and the liegemen of Danish Estonia, also using the term king's men, because this is also a German language text. Uh, maybe it was originally in Latin, but uh, maybe not. I mean, the Danish law codes of the 13th century were written in Danish. So it may be that this one was also originally already written in Low German. I don't know. 
so because we have no idea if this was actually in Latin or not, because the, the oldest manuscripts date from the middle of the 16th century, and they are all in uh, Low German or translated to High German. So, what the um, the Liegemen had, uh, in my opinion, a very specific position in royal right, administration. Uh, they should not be contrasted to the viceroy and the bishop as mm, the old historiography says that you know, the, the king has two uh, supporters in Danish Estonia, the viceroy and, and the bishop of Tallinn, whereas the liegemen are his um, say, like counterplayers. You know. In my opinion, they function together, uh, same as the viceroy, same as the, Reba, uh, the bishop. The liegemen also travelled personally to Denmark and counselled the king because they appear as witnesses in royal charters. Not as a group, but as single persons. So, and we know that they communicated with the king through letters because we have three existent letters from the corporation written to the king. So the, there must have been more. And again, the king authorizes certain specific persons, naming them, uh, usually the most prominent ones, uh, uh, also councillors, to execute royal decisions. He, he basically says that you know the viceroy, the bishop, and these, for example, four liegemen, then have to fulfill this concrete royal order. And furthermore, they also uh, acted as royal judges. So, and then when they judge cases, we have documents of them judging cases, they often say, I am presiding over this law court mm, and in, so, uh, in the name of the king. So they, are, they, they, they don't have their own authority, but they are acting as royal judges with the royal authority. So in this sense, we can speak of the the, the Lichman being incorporated into the royal administration, functioning together with the, the royal administration. But of course, that doesn't mean that uh, everything is always, always well and good. Uh, so, now, I would like to draw some specific examples of how the interaction between the king and the Lichman worked. So, this one uh, is based on the, the earliest letter uh, written by the corporation to the king. So the, the point of the letter is that the group of the liegemen, so the corporation, has made an agreement with the bishop on uh, the payment of uh, synodal dues. Now, the king has the authority to decide uh, how church taxes are paid in Danish Estonia. This is very strange, but that's how it is. We know uh, royal decrees on this matter from the beginning of the, uh, so in, from the early 40s, but also from the uh, reign of Eric Menmet, for example, where Eric decides that church taxes should be paid with this measure, for example. So it's quite clear. Now, they meet, read an agreement, and then they ask the king to ratify this agreement. And then they turn to, uh, to Christopher, they, and they specifically say that they want the, this agreement ratified because otherwise it would be invalidated by the invidium uh, of a few. So, they specifically refer that they do not have the authority, they do not have the strength to guarantee that everybody will keep the agreement. So that's why they want the king to ratify it. So, and, uh, so they reach the king, but uh, Christopher dies, so they, they send another um, embassy next year, and in, in June 1260, Eric V, or, or say, the Regency Council, uh, then confirms the agreement and, and states that uh, that everybody has to honor this with the punishment of the loss of their fees. So if somebody does not honor the agreement, then the viceroy can take away their fee or the royal authority. So this is con 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 quite concrete. The leashmen cannot govern themselves uh, in this sense. They don't have the legitimacy to, to, to rule. They need the king. They need these royal decisions that, in order to put in force an agreement that they themselves have made. Uh, second letter is from 1296. It's, it's quite, quite puzzling. Uh, it informs the king of a complaint uh, by merchants that the merchants have raised in front of the liegemen and in front of royal officials that this man, Heinrich von Orkis, from Orkis and his accomplices uh, have attacked a group of merchants on the eastern side of Narva River, so outside the Danish jurisdiction, so in Russian territory, 
and they have um, seized the goods of these merchants and brought the goods into royal castles. So uh, they asked the king, uh, they explained to the king that this act is illegal and uh, the king must uh, revoke this illegal confiscation of the royal goods because um, so, so that the merchants and, and the king's land, uh, your land, so the Ingestonia could enjoy their traditional liberties. So, quite clear again, they are not able to, to force their will upon another leech man. Uh, and the thing is, why I did I write this here? The thing is that it's, if you think that this man was just a simple robber, how did, was he able and why did he bring his goods into royal castles? Why did he store them there? He was, he, if he was simply a criminal. Second of all, why would uh, the liegeman need to convince the king that this act had been illegal? I mean, it would have been obvious if this had been a robbery. I think that this man may have actually been a royal official and his actions were probably sanctioned by the viceroy. And it's quite probable that the, the merchants had done something to merit this attack. That they may have traveled through um, roads that were not meant to be used by foreign merchants because foreign merchants were only allowed to travel on certain roads. So if they passed the castle of Narva, where you had to check the uh, traffic between uh, Denise Estonia and, and Novgorod, so if they, if they went around it, then they might have been uh, attacked because of this. But of course this is a um, just uh, a theory, but still I, I, I believe that this man may have been a royal official. Again, you know, the leechmen don't have um, a possibility to act against him, but they are quite sure that if the king orders him to return the goods, then this will happen. Uh, I mean, the, otherwise, they would not have no point of writing this to the king. Uh, then we come to the other cases of confronting with the king. This is a very uh, common case which has always been served to demonstrate how independent uh, Denis Estoni was and uh, that they never listened to the king. Uh, so there was a, a merchant ship from Lübeck. Uh, it was stranded on the coast of Veronia. Uh, and when the, the merchant goods were being salvaged, something happened. Uh, we only know the Lübeckian side. The Lübeckian side says that the liegeman and uh, the monks from the monastery of Falkenau, uh, which is in the, in the Torbat diocese, they stole their goods. I think that this is um, improbable. It's probably a conflict about who has the rights to wreckage salvage in, on the coast. And as far as we know about wreckage rights uh, in 13th or 14th century Livonia, the, the, the liegeman had uh, the right to, 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 to salvage the wreckage. And it seems that uh, basically maybe everyone who had a share of the, the coastline had uh, these rights. And this was in... Um, so, and, and at the same time, Lübeck had the royal privileges that said that uh, they are free from every wreckage right. And that no Danish, the royal official could um, de uh, demand like wreckage fees from them. They could uh, challenge everything on the road. So, the Lübeckians turned to Queen Agnes of Denmark, who is the... The, the, the widow of the late King Eric V, who was just murdered a couple of months ago, and they get, got from her uh, two charters which are quite clearly in the favor of the Lubeckians. So the charters say that uh, the viceroy and the vassals have to find the perpetrators and get the goods and give them over to Lubeckian merchants who are residing in Reval, and there the goods should be stored until the, uh, the royal uh, decision is made on this case. So, when the Lubeckian envoy goes to Reval, he, uh, the, the Viceroy organizes a meeting on the 24th of June, and there the Viceroy um, and the Leechman state that they will not fulfill these orders. They don't <laughs> really explain why, uh, at least it's not really explicitly stated in the, in the letter, but they do, the, do say this. We have written a letter to the king, not only uh, the, the, the Viceroy, but also the councillors, the Bishop of Reval, and the town council of Reval. So the four of them, they all wrote a letter to the king uh, to explain their point of view. And they said that 
we will only concede to do what the king answers to us, to our letter. So they do not accept this, um, these two uh, royal documents that are quite clearly in the favor of Lübeck. But it doesn't mean that they don't respect the royal authority. They just want, want to, to have their opinion heard. And what happens is that later on, uh, the, the viceroy personally goes to Denmark and also some uh, liegemen and they talk with the Regency Council of Andres Eric VI and the Regency Council states that uh, we will follow the Estonian jurisdiction in the, the solving of this case. So it's, they declare that, you know, the, the, the Lübeckians will get their goods back, but um, uh, according to uh, the legal traditions of Estonia. So how the case actually ends, it's a bit fuzzy, but uh, it seems to me that the Lübeckians did not really get what they want. So it seems that uh, at least... So I think that the case was still up in, in 1295, so... Uh, no. Um, so another one is the extremely famous uh, oh, yeah. case, yeah. and uh, I don't really want to talk about it in, in very much detail because I don't just have the time. But the idea is that, in, in my interpretation, the uh, alliance of uh, 1304 was meant for the eyes of the king. So, uh, because as soon as they made the alliance, they let the viceroy make a copy of it, and the viceroy dispatched the copy uh, to the king as soon as the sea um, route was opened. So Eric got the copy of this alliance agreement along with uh, a letter from the viceroy already at the end of May. So the, and the alliance was made in February. Mm -hmm. So I think that they really wanted to, to convince the king to revoke this Christopher's appointment as Duke of Estonia. So in the sense, it was meant to, to put diplomatic pressure on the king. Again, uh, what we see is that Christopher was not yet duke in the sense that he, he has no lordship. The viceroy is still in office. And in August, the king still kills a thief in Danish Estonia. Again, we can clearly see he still fulfills the role of the, mm. le uh, the liege lord. So it seems that what they managed to do was to at least postpone the uh, transfer of lordship to Christopher. Then in 1305, we know that the liegemen have suddenly taken over their castles. And then again, they send an embassy to the king, explain their reasons, and the king pardons them. So, and what then happens is that they, they give these castles over mm -hmm. to Henrik or Heinrich or whatever. We don't actually know if he was German or Dane or he might have been an Italian. So, maybe I should write Enrico here. <laughs> so, it, it is, this man had been in royal service since his appointment as bishop, so he was quite clearly uh, an agent of the king. And we can see that the, the liegemen basically gave away their most strong asset, the castles, to an agent of the king. I would say that this was a, a, a compromise agreement between the, the liegemen and the king to have some sort of um, uh, administration until the matter was solved, because Christopher also had claims, you know, he was demanding uh, that the area was given over to him. We know from a, a letter from 1306 that the uh, liegeman wrote to the king that there was someone who was um, making complaints and, and, and making um, suggestions that, uh, that uh, Henrik is abusing his power and that the liegeman have abused uh, the, their rights. We don't know exactly what the allegations were, but we know what the, the liegeman said to disprove these allegations. So there were people trying to convince the king that the liegeman and the bishop are acting really badly. So, in the end, uh, the king then gives, let's say, surrenders to the will of the liegeman in the sense that he gives Christopher another area. So, uh, the uh, Duchy of Southern Holland, which is, of course, uh, quite um, understandable because you cannot <laughs> enforce this man there in the ancient Estonia and, and expect him to rule. Uh, normally, it, it would just, you know, drive up the conflict. So, in my opinion, this whole situation shows us how uh, both sides were basically pushing each other with diplomatic means and at the same time were quite often willing to compromise. Mm -hmm. So, they did not want to, to bring the conflict into uh, a point where violence would erupt. So, they, they are 
lenient with each other. And the third uh, thing that I wanted to say before ending is just a few examples of uh, complying with the kingdom. Uh, first of all, we know okay, <laughs> the source material is extremely short, uh, but the, it, it seems that the king makes an, an audit of uh, royal fiefs in the ancient Estonia at approximately that time. Uh, because um, in 1313, the uh, king orders, the king declares that uh, if one of his uh, liegemen in Estonia dies without heirs, then his landed goods shall fall to the king. No, and if uh, such liegeman has sold his goods, uh, but it, with the intent of buying new ones, but has died <laughs> before he bought new ones, then the money that he got from the sale should go to the king. And then he sends uh, an envoy called Johann Bernauer to seek out such landed goods that have um, say, fall, fallen to someone else and that should belong to the king and, and seek out this, uh, this money. And then what we see uh, is that the next year, both the, so next year, Stephanus, Johannes Stephanius mentions that feudal letters, feudal charters were given out in the inhabitants of Estonia. So he, he Stephanius basically based his uh, knowledge on the uh, royal archive, uh, which at, at the beginning of the 17th century still had documents, uh, which for now are lost. And Arjen Guitfeld says that the king uh, made a lot of enfeltments. He lists 60 names and said that they were made by Eric VI in Kolding in 1318. So we know that Eric was not in Kolding in 1318, but he was there in 1314. So the editors of Matar and Daniko have dated these enfeltments to 1314, based on, on Stephanus. I think that maybe that the enfeltments were actually made during a longer period of time, because it would be preposterous to believe that everyone from Estonia to Estonia went to, the, uh, to Denmark at the same time. So they would to, to go during a longer period of time. And the list of Rutbert's names is quite uh, uh, different. He, he, he mentions 38 different persons, some of them uh, more than once, because it seems that these people, uh, so Voldemar van Dolen, uh, Dile van Dolen and Engelbert van Dolen, had portions of different fiefs uh, shared. So they sh a share in uh, different fiefs. And then uh, he has 10 entries which are based on the fief. So, and felt those from Lukanusa, for example. So, implying that there are more than, than one person, maybe. And then uh, eight entries are just listing the family name. So, we have uh, given fiefs to the one Hildesheim, uh, Hildesheim family, for example. So. This is a, a strange kind of list, and, and after these 60 names, he said, and, and much more. So basically, we have more than half of these persons listed by Hutfeld, so it's quite horrible to believe that basically everyone got their thieves renewed. And we know Eric had been ruling since 1287, so it's preposterous to believe that this is the first environment. So this has to be a royal audit that the Legion accepted, and, uh, but just have a minimum amount of knowledge on it. And what is also interesting is the writing down of the feudal law coincides with this audit. So it, it makes sense that during the audit the principles of inheritance, uh, renewing of fees and all sorts of matters that the, the feudal law is focusing on cause an I would say disagreement. Uh, and, and so uh, both the, the king uh, and the leechman will find it uh, important that you know, maybe these things should be written down. Uh, and the second uh, uh, example of complying with the king is the, uh, these few uh, notices of, of um, extraordinary royal taxation from Danish Estonia. So a charter uh, from 1325 states that the inhabitants of Estonia had at one time promised to pay King Eric VI uh, 2,000 marks of silver. So, uh, and then, uh, but they only paid 1,060 marks. So the, pay was, the, the payment was, was discontinued. So most probably this is an extraordinary taxation from the end of Eric's reign. You know that he, uh, in 1318 and 1319 he uh, made extraordinary, rather, extraordinary taxes for half a mark per one plowland, 
Um, when uh, Danish Estonia in uh, 1240 around had 5,389 or 5,800 5, plowlands. So approximately 3.35 marks per plowland. So it's significantly lower than the half a mark uh, in Denmark. But still, you can see that uh, they may, maybe negotiated the taxes to a smaller level, but still they were agreed to pay extra mineral taxes to the king. And in 1325 is the first year that we know that Christopher II is demanding extraordinary royal taxes. So the plow, plow tax. And at the same year, 40 leachmen appear in Wartenburg and they give out um, a pledge to the king that they will pay the remaining sum uh, of 940 marks of silver to King Christopher by uh, St. Michael's Day, so by, by September. So this is uh, somewhere in, in the in the summer. Uh, of course, they don't actually do that. <laughs> they, they pay a couple of years later. But what's very important, they pay the money during the time when Christopher II is in exile in Rostock, which they would never have done if they had accepted uh, Valdemar III as the legitimate king. And the third mention of taxation is from uh, 1340, 1341, when uh, Cistercian monasteries that held whole goods in ancient Estonia um, complain to the Pope that the uh, Viceroy is uh, demanding um, taxes from us and I mean, monasteries are exempted from every kind of normal taxation uh, but as far as we know again when it comes to extraordinary taxation then church lands are taxed and you know that Valdemar IV started um, to collect extraordinary taxes with the consent of uh, the noblemen of Denmark and also the bishops already, basically from the beginning of his reign, from already from 1340, and you know, it lasted, um, I, I, as far as I know, for the whole duration of his reign. So, um, and, or not, for the whole? I think he stops by 1360, when okay. all of Denmark is more or less redeemed. So, basically, the, these complaints by the Cistercians uh, in my opinion, quite clearly show that these extraordinary taxes, which were paid in Denmark, were also paid in the system. So, to draw some small conclusions, first of all, we can see that the liegemen and the towns of Danish Estonia emphasize the status as vassals and subjects of the Danish king. Because, yes, it's very difficult to say anything about the two other towns, but so we can say, yeah, liegemen and Reva. So they emphasize their status and their connection to the Danish king. Specifically, not just a king, but the Danish king. And as far as I would say, based on these examples, uh, they more or less respect royal authority. And the second conclusion is that Northern Estonia was ruled by consensus. So the consensus of the king and the elite of Danish Estonia. So by elite I mean the liegeman, the bishop, the high clergy, and, and, and also I think in some sense the towns, because they, they would also send their enemies to the king to petition for, for charters, and, and so the kings would respect them if they petitioned. But of course the, 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 the councillors and the bishop and the viceroy would, would have um, more opportunities to counsel the king on making decisions regarding the Estonia. But of course, of course, they could not be always there. And we know that they were always also writing to the king, but nevertheless, sometimes they, they still had conflicts. But even in, in these cases of the conflicts, we can see a willing to compromise with each other, rather than, than uh, to push the relations to the point of armed conflict. Because the only armed conflict against the, the Danish authority in Danish Estonia was the uprising of 1343. And, and this uprising was not only against the, the royal administration, but also against the liegemen and the clergy, of course. So we, we, we can't really see uh, any um, uprising of the top level of Danish Estonia against the king, which we can see in, in Denmark. Yeah. So that's where I finish. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Extremely interesting. And actually, you have just given one uh, important answer to, to Stefan's question. Uh, these uh, <coughs> church people uh, have contact to, to Denmark, the bishops. I mean, they had a lot of other people who could go and convey their messages. Yeah. You give them an impression of love of communication. Uh, maybe you should uh, say two words about Valdemar the Third. Why uh, is it okay that they do not recognize him? Maybe not everybody knows who okay. uh, Valdemar the Third. Yes. Uh, Valdemar the Third was a Duke of uh, Schleswig or Southern Jutland, and he um, was elected King of Denmark by, let's say, a very small group of people. So which included the, the Count of uh, Holstein, Rendsburg, Gerhard III uh, and, and, and um, a small number of uh, Danish uh, liegemen uh, not, not, not liegemen, a small number of Danish Irish aristocrats among them also people who were uh, fighting against uh, Christopher for a long time like Knut Porse who had been enemy of Christopher for four years at least and it was, he was elected king after uh, Christopher was forced to ex uh, into exile from Denmark so it was basically a coup uh, which was something that had, but well, last time it happened in Denmark in 1250 when Eric IV was murdered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and I mean, he had not a king until the five, four or five generations yeah. before. So, yeah, I think it's very convincing and very interesting that they do not accept him. Yeah, questions, comments? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, that was very impressive. Um, could you take us back to the slide with, uh, with con confronting the king too? Yeah, thank you. Because here we have uh, 1305, where the Leesman gave the castle to a good close to Biden, namely Henrik of Britain. Yes. And as I, if I remember um, uh, Stefan's uh, paper right, uh, I think Stefan said that, that Bishop Henry Henrico, mm. yeah, whatever, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Henry or whatever, yeah, stayed in Denmark from from uh, like uh, 12, 95. 98 until 1305. So it's more or less, yeah, actually more or less, it's given this immediately. It's still in Denmark, this and then why, this is why he travels back. To yes, yeah. I think this is why he travels back. So yeah, he, 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 was, uh, he spent a lot of time in Rome uh, working with, uh, for the Danish king yeah. uh, to do, you know, against Jens Grant. Yeah. But he, he, was also, he also participated in uh, the uh, solving of difference be between the Church of Riga and the Teutonic Order. Mm -hmm. uh, so Isarmus, who was Bishop of Riga in 13, on, on 1300 until 1302, uh, uh, so he worked together with Isarmus when, at that time. And later on, when his arms was Bishop of Archbishop of Lund, then also Henrik worked with his arms uh, in, in attempts to solve this dispute between Riga, then Riga town, uh, later on. So he was still in, in, at, at the Curia in March 1304. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thanks. I didn't have a question. Now. So, yeah, the point is that um, I think that, I don't know, but I think that. Maybe the reason why they took the castles over was because the king had recalled the viceroy, uh, and so uh, because we don't know uh, of the viceroy after 1304, he next appears basically like 10 years later. Of course, it's quite probable that he he was appointed again uh, quite soon in 1307. But the thing is that in the meantime, there there is one document. Uh, so basically, the, the letter to the king, which quite clearly states that Henry is fulfilling uh, the role of the Viceroy. So it must be that there was no Viceroy at the time. So if, it, if the king gave the administration over to Henry, so basically it's like, um, so officially we would say that this is a, a, a neutral person uh, who would hold the land until uh, the solution has been decided upon whether it should belong to the king or to the duke. But in fact, it's just you know, the king's agent. Yeah. So I think that this is what, what happened. And then his, his, his uh, tenants then ended when, uh, when Christopher was given the, another fee. Yeah. So apparently the Danish bishops were more royal uh, uh, servants than bishops. Of course. Considering that they didn't attend the, uh, the Christian synods in Denmark. Why um, Yeah. 
That's also true because of the conflict between the archbishops and the king. Exactly. So, because as far as we know, the bishops of Revel were loyal to the king and not to the archbishop. Yeah, yeah okay. please. Yeah, um, I'm wondering about on, on your presentation, but then you know, coming to the conclusion that is there really a, a contradiction uh, between the 19th century uh, statements and, and these 21st century statements um, that you know, the emphasis is in is different places? Mm -hmm. They don't really, really contradict with one another because, like, uh, Funga and all, uh, kind of said that the king of Denmark didn't meddle in Northern Estonia as a fest, uh, which is like kind of true. Uh, and and you are you are kind of continuing from there, saying that not only the king didn't meddle, but more like that the people here, like like in the relationship, like um, Funga was saying, no, the king didn't. The king wasn't the active uh, active side. The two sides were kind of like I don't know, passive or or distant. But, but then you you are saying that, that the Estonian side was the more active side, that, that these guys were very, very interested in, uh, in, in in being very closely associated with the King of Denmark. Well, the kind of like this, uh, I don't know, uh, well, one might be question, um, like who was more interested in the relationship, the King or, or the Estonian nobility? Uh, so I would say that to answer your question, I would have to give another <laughs> 30 minutes paper. <laughs> And this time from the, from the perspective of the king, because this presentation was meant to, to give the Estonian perspective. That, that was the whole point. So I didn't uh, speak of uh, what uh, the king wanted so much, but what the, what the, why the, the leechman needed the king. So the, the, the idea of Unga is that uh, Danish Estonia is more or less self-managing. So like, he even says at the end that the viceroy is basically the full representative of the king. So, you know, and then the leechmen are basically giving their counsel to the viceroy. And then, you know, like the viceroy would be like the, more or less like a local, local king in this sense. Uh, which is not really true. He, he, he says that because of this fact that the, the very last viceroy had full royal powers. And he says that, you know, this man had full royal powers, we know that. So most probably the earlier ones also had. But it's quite clear that this is a very extra extraordinary case. And there uh, is absolutely no way at all that earlier viceroys had this uh, authority that the final one had. Because he basically could give out charters, make decisions that were officially made by Valdemar. So he gives a charter by Valdemar in Reval. A huge amounts of them. They are all official, valid royal charters. But are you still doing the same mistake as uh, 100 years ago that you're presenting the uh, high nobility as, as one group, either fighting against the king or cooperating? Were they, were they one community? Or you had some examples with uh, the king and also some, some troubles yeah. uh, among themselves? I don't think that they were. Um, but it's extremely difficult to, to say something specific on it. So, I think, yeah, this uh, example of uh, Heinrich von Orgis yeah, exactly. is the best one that we have. And the other one also is that, you know, the, the in, um, I'd say, you know, the, the envy of the few. You know, we, we cannot be sure if, uh, if, if everybody will follow the agreement. So these are the two, two uh, places which very clearly show that the cooperation does not actually seem to represent everyone. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that uh, when we see uh, who are the witnesses or who pla place their names under the charter, then it's usually a very small number of people. Uh, I think the largest one is from uh, 1306 when we have 35 names, which is actually enormous. And then, yeah, this is uh, a document that was uh, given, a, a letter written in the name of the king, in the name of the corporation. And I think the, the most large one is the, the, this um, agreement that, that they gave to Christopher in 1925, because this has 40 names on it. 40 individuals saying that they uh, guarantee that uh, we, will, we will pay this money. And they are equally divided, 20 from uh, the western part, so Harry and Revala, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, 20 from Veronia. 
So I, I like that much you remarked that they promised to do it within a certain date. Yes. Of course they, they did not, but it came later. Yeah. It sounds like uh, deadlines for articles. <laughs> I think that, yes. <laughs> a little bit. So it's, it's quite clear that uh, <laughs> they did not. Yeah, at the, at the point it, it came, came, it came yeah. that's actually the most important. It's not yeah. that they. How does the sum uh, stated in, in, uh, in the source? Is it just an aggregated sum or is it, you know, to any use when you've got to pay this amount? And uh, in, the, in the first charter, it's stated that, um, uh, that the, they have to pay the remaining part of these 2,000 marks. Mm -hmm. And then uh, two years later, we have these two um, what's it, checks, you know, uh, declarations of what they have paid. And in these declarations, we can read that, uh, that the action only had to pay 940. So the original one doesn't list how, mu how much they have paid to, to Eric Menemet. But the later ones, they, they do. And um, I don't remember the exact sum that they paid uh, in the installments, of course, but it was probably around like 400 uh, something something. So they more or less half in, 12, uh, in 1327 and the second half in 1328. And this, yeah, it's, it's amazing that these two charters are preserved actually, <laughs> because there's so, so little uh, info from this period. Because that we have absolutely no, uh, so basically these, these three letters that I mentioned, that these two petitions are the only petitions that we have. I mean, it's, it's obvious that there are tons of petitions to the king. They are mentioned in royal sources, but only these two letters have survived that you can see as classical petitions in the sense. So, yeah. Thank you. Any more questions, comments? Last chance. If not, thank you so much again.